Hello and welcome to this audio commentary for Stanley Kubrick's The Shining from 1980. This is being recorded as part of the Rental Breakdown Project and Proper Horror Show. And over the course of this commentary, I'm going to be talking about the two hour, 23 minute version of The Shining. That is the original cut, the US version. And it might sound odd that I have to specify that, but I just want to be clear for European friends that uh, if you're in my neck of the woods, you might be used to the shorter European version that's missing about 25 minutes of footage. If you're used to that version, make sure you get the full American cut, otherwise this commentary will be hard to follow and it might also be confusing. If you're watching the new one, you're going to see a lot of new material. We'll get into that as we go. I also want to talk now about the music you're hearing quickly. This is an original piece and that's very unusual for Stanley Kubrick. He really likes using classical music, uh, something that he increasingly leaned on in his career. I will talk about that in some depth later, but I just want to note that this main title theme, that is an original by Wendy Carlos and Rachel Elkind. Carlos had worked previously with Kubrick on A Clockwork Orange and obviously did something right. We've just passed a section there where uh, an unfortunate mistake had been uh, edited out a shadow of the helicopter that is currently swooping at that car like it was a bird of prey. And I really love that shot. Uh, maybe it's a little awkward to fix it digitally, but it probably is for the best. This shot is absolutely astonishing. It's setting us up for some greatness here because that music is adding to what the visuals are showing us. We are looking at some beautiful shots of nature, but Kubrick is giving us a feeling here of a bird of prey following something, stalking its prey. We're seeing this tiny car absolutely dwarfed by its surroundings. You're seeing nothing else following it. The cars that uh, you see are stopped or they're going in the opposite direction. And you're getting that sense of foreboding, all helped by this by this music, which is reflecting a little bit of the DS era or the uh, Day of Wrath, adding this huge ominous tone to what you're seeing. Instead of just pretty nature, you are seeing a car venturing into the unknown, venturing into area no one else is going and looking absolutely overwhelmed by the daunting surroundings. Those surroundings now also including your first shot of the Timberline Lodge and no maze. I have to note that right now. There is no maze. Now that's something really easy to overlook in this, no uh, pun intended there, but it's absolutely crucial to one of the things I want to tell you about in this video, which is uh, fairly well recorded at this point, thanks to the excellent work of Rob Agar, but we will have to talk about the impossible geometry of the overlook. But as well as noting how this hotel logistically, uh, geometrically makes no sense, we'll also tell you how that works in the film. Now look at this office that's going into now. You see behind it, there must have been a corridor. Now Jack goes into it. There's no corridor behind it. It apparently opens up into the uh, great outdoors. Look at all that wonderful sunlight in the bush. That's just a little, little thing that throws you off that you may not notice consciously or but to uh, steal from red letter media you may have you may not have noticed it but your brain did if you've never heard of the uh, impossible geometry thing before this this might be a bit uh, mind-blowing for you we'll we'll point out a few of them but really rob agar is the person you should go to for this i will uh, move away from that now and uh, i should also point out that uh, this is a, a rare rare bit of footage in The Shining because it wasn't shot by Stanley Kubrick. He built everything on sets as much as he could because he, at this point in his life in 1980, was incredibly averse to traveling. Absolutely avoided it as much as he could. Even going across the water to Ireland for Barry Lyndon, the film that immediately preceded this, that was a bit much for him. So the rest of the Overlook uh, will be filmed in Science Shepparton Studios in England. But he, uh, because he just did not want to travel, he especially did not want to fly. The footage you, sh you saw around North Oregon there and uh, the Timberline Lodge and Mount Hood, that was all done by a second unit. 
Some of the other work that was done uh, not by Kubrick was, of course, Finding Danny, who we just saw there, played by Danny Lloyd. We'll obviously talk about the casting later. But uh, the casting for Danny Lloyd was done by uh, Leon Vitali, who at that point had moved from being an actor uh, in Barry Lyndon to being a Kubrick assistant. That's a bit of a trait you see in Kubrick's career. He he really does give people a chance to prove themselves and he will let them absolutely shoot up the ranks if they impress him. There's a great tale from the uh, from 2001, A Space Odyssey, where he needed to shoot some deserts, but obviously he didn't want to travel to find a desert. So he, he was asking, can, can I get a desert in England? A, a very ambitious tea boy. Uh, that assistant's name, as I recall, is Andrew Birkin. He stepped up and said he knew where there was some desert in England. Um, he was lying. Uh, he was absolutely, yes, I will say improvising. Um, but Kubrick wanted to find out, so he hooked up with a camera guy, got himself a camera, and then went home and consulted his encyclopedias and found out that there was a little area of desert-like land around Liverpool. So he shot off up there. Uh, overnight, got the footage, came back on the earliest train possible, delivered the footage to Kubrick, and immediately got himself promoted from the T-boy into, I think, a production assistant making triple the money. I love stories about that. I've um, I've been looking in a lot into Kubrick for this because part of the challenge of talking about The Shining is so many people have talked about it, so much has been said, and I don't want to basically just repeat the IMDB trivia page to you. I'll give you a little clue now of what I'm going to try and talk about over the course of this commentary. I'll be talking about Kubrick's unique filmmaking style, how it helped, how it hindered. I have to discuss the total rejection of Stephen King's understanding of The Shining and the fallout of that. Some quite feisty times there. And uh, also something I think rare and new, something I, I think you won't hear other people talk about which is the sources that Kubrick drew from over and instead of Stephen King's book, because he was rejecting huge amounts of Stephen King's uh, source material there. So I guess the question you have to then ask is, what did he draw from instead? And inevitably, as The Shining is deliberately oblique in places, I will be giving my interpretation of the film in a way that the very interviewer of Stanley Kubrick never would. There was a H.P. Lovecraft quotation that Kubrick really liked, uh, in all things mysterious, never explain. Well, it certainly helps me because he won't be uh, giving any interviews where he sort of says I'm hugely wrong, uh, which is a bit of a boon here. Now, there's something we sort of uh, skipped over in this scene, which is a, a nugget of information that was dropped about five minutes in, asking why Jack is an ex-teacher. Why isn't he teaching anymore? It's a simple thing, you might ask. it. It's just sort of glanced over. You'll see in his uh, apartment with uh, Wendy and Danny, there are books absolutely everywhere, so I assume those were in his office or they're part of his writing career. But you're not going to get an explanation for why he stopped being a teacher. But it's a little foreshadowing. Things haven't gone exactly how he wanted. He's making a brave face of it. He's boasting that this is a great opportunity for him to write, but I think we've early on got hints that he is not exactly here out of choice. He's been forced out of teaching, and that's why he's now uh, going for this job of caretaker in a hotel over the winter months. Now, at this point, I want to talk about one of those aforementioned unspoken sources that Kubrick used, um, because it's going to show up quite soon, and I just need to ground us in it. And that is Freud's essay, The Uncanny, or Das Unheimische, from 1919. There's only 21 pages, uh, so it's quite a quick read, but I will, see that, I will say that it's dated quite a lot, so there are a lot of references to stories that are outside of our common cultural knowledge, such as Huffman's The Sandman, that aren't really helpful to us, but there is a lot in that essay that really helps explain The Shining. Now, the first four pages concentrate on dissecting the word heimlich and unheimlich. Bear with me, this is, it's a tough style I know, uh, sort of explaining German etymology, but it will help us here. 
So Heimlich in one sense means homely and familiar, but it can also mean secret, closed and unknown. Think of the word Geheim, kept secret, right? So Unheimlich is typically used as an opposite to the first meaning of Heimlich, but it is effectively the second meaning of Heimlich. And to quote from the essay, Thus Heimlich is a word the meaning of which develops towards an ambivalence until it finally coincides with its opposite, Unheimlich. Unheimlich is in some way or other a subspecies of Heimlich. By the way, uh, Europeans, this is a possibly brand new footage for you if you've never seen the American version before. Actually, I think that'll be uh, the next section with the uh, psychiatrist. Anyway. The key to the uncanny is you're getting from the etymology is unsettling ambiguity, the challenging of what was assumed definite and normalcy gaining an abnormal quality. And some of those examples are, of the ambiguity are the fear of dolls being animate or unsettlingly seeing patterns in what should be randomness, like for instance, say the word two, the number 237 recurring quite a lot. Also doppelgangers like Grady's daughters uh, are also uncanny as they undermine the ego, they challenge uh, uh, challenge certainty. And of course we specify they are daughters, they are not twins. And uh, I think we'll see them now. Um, as Ullman told us in the office, they are eight and 10 years old, they are not twins, but they've been forced to dress alike. Back to the etymology, um, uncanniness is built into the overlook. Remember, Heimlich is meant to be homely. So what's like a home, but not a home. Well, a hotel is like a home, but it's not a home. The impossible geometry, there they are there. The impossible geometry, that also builds into uncanniness because it challenges your certainty. You just, you can't get a feel of the hotel and you start feeling lost in it. And that is part of the uncanniness that Kubrick wanted you to feel. Here's that uh, footage that is brand new to Europeans. Now I have to talk about this aspect here. This is a uh, very, very new to Europeans and it really helps one interpretation of the film uh, that Rob Agar popularizes, that there is a non-supernatural horror in The Shining, which is based around uh, child abuse. Look here how Danny is vulnerable, how that bear behind him is looming, a sort of imposing in a kind of threatening manner when we get that shot. The fact that he's in the bed with no trousers on, it's a little unusual. Why does he not have trousers on? It's a little bit unsettling. And what he's talking about here, discussing Tony, it's also unsettling. It might sound unusual that focus on the bear looking sort of uncomfortably close to him. You're going to see a bear later in this film, or rather you're going to see a man dressed in a bear costume. There's this, it's building up this uh, unfortunate, imposing sexual connection here. Um, the best person to read on this is Rob Agar, but I will bring in a bit of his theories. This is all meant to be unsettling, kind of intimate. You're going to see future scenes which build up a sort of sexual threat towards Danny that might be one interpretation of what's actually going on there. Now, as much as I like and am very convinced by Rob Agar's theory, uh, which he uh, which he explains in his video, Jack the Abusive Father, um, I should point out that Stanley Kubrick would disagree with it in part uh, if you could get him to explain things very openly. Uh, because he said ultimately The Shining is about supernatural forces, but he wanted to keep you uh, focused on plausible natural explanations that slowly got edge out until ultimately you are left having to go with a supernatural explanation. That moment uh, from the few interviews you can find from him, some few discussions and some um, evidence in the documentary The Making of the Shining by his daughter Vivian Kubrick. Ultimately that moment where you do have to go for a supernatural explanation is the moment when Jack is let out of the cold storage that he's locked in. Although a counter to that is that Rob Agar also did a video explaining a bunch of ways where Jack could have got out of there that are non-supernatural. So I guess the option is still open there. 
Something I'll pick up on here quickly that I'd like you to look out for is what Wendy is interested in. Now, she gets a lot of flack here. Shelley Devell, who was uh, not a famous actress in this. Uh, she had done some work with Robert Altman, but otherwise she was a character actor uh, who was not hugely well known. So this was a big step up for her. Um, she gets a lot of criticism. Uh, Stephen King, very disappointingly, but perhaps now uh, post-2016, uh, more understandably, really disliked the portrayal of Wendy and called her called it absolutely misogynistic. In this scene, I don't go for that at all. I think when uh, Shelley Duvall is doing an amazing job here, trying to keep up a front, trying to keep up a brave face, when she's describing the... Um, the trouble, uh, well, basically the abuse of Danny by Jack, uh, this injury that we'll get more details on later in the film. You can tell from her subtle acting that she doesn't really believe what she's saying. She's trying to brush it off as purely an accident, but you're getting it communicated to you that there's a lot more to it. That's great acting. Um, I think she does a fantastic job and she, she really sells the film to me. She has a tough job and she had a very tough time making this, as I will get into. But I don't want it... I don't want her performance criticised. Uh, she was given a Razzie for her performance, which was later withdrawn, and I believe rightly so. Now, very interestingly, we will not get the psychiatrist's full reaction to this. In fact, after this, we will not see her again. But... We're going to get a jump to a title card, a hard cut, which isn't going to help us know how successful Wendy was in convincing the psychiatrist. It's um, it's a tension that isn't uh, resolved. And throughout the film, Kubrick is going to use those title cards to just jump to something else and deny us a sort of resolution that we would expect, which is also a method of maintaining tension in the film. It's a sort of unusual um, rhythm in the film that will sort of unsettle, sort of keep it feeling a bit uncanny because you're not exactly sure where things are going. You don't get what you expected. Certainly people turning up uh, for an adaptation of Stephen King's story are not getting what they expected either in some quite major ways and it's going to keep throwing them off throughout the, throughout the film. Something I want to pay attention to there quickly is that Throughout this, pay attention to what Wendy is interested in. See if you see any evidence whatsoever of her being interested in uh, ghost stories and horror films, because from what we've seen, she certainly isn't the confirmed ghost story and horror film addict that Jack says she is in the interview. We just saw her reading Catcher in the Rye, not a famously spooky story. We'll see her watching TV and it's just daytime soaps or the weather. From everything we see in the film, Jack was absolutely lying in the interview, just trying to charm Ullman and Bill. Um, he was lying about Wendy. She, so, she shows no interest in that whatsoever. Very sneaky. This seems as good a time as any to mention one of the other sources that Stanley Kubrick used to help direct the film, to help get the right atmosphere. And that is David Lynch's Eraserhead. He screened that for the cast and crew to help convey the kind of tone that he was wanting. And whilst they are very, very different films, I think I like to think that him choosing such an atypical horror was him trying to convey to them. We are really not doing the standard thing here. We really want this disconcerting atmosphere. We're going to make something truly unique. I like to think that's what he was getting at. Now, a little thing we might want to uh, note there. Um, by the way, this, I believe, is Lontano by uh, Yorghi Leghetti, uh, one of the classical pieces that will make up most of the film soundtrack. Uh, we go again there to uh, the Timberline Lodge. Look, no maze. It's so easy to miss that, so easy. And now we are back in Shepperton Studios. I think I should have said Elstree Studios, apologies. The maze we should talk about here, I mean, maybe it's not the best time, but just while I'm on it, um, the maze is an addition by Kubrick later. We can talk about the symbology later, but one of the things that he cut out of the novel 
in place of the maze was the uh, animated hedge animals. He thought they were goofy, he thought uh, they would be silly, so that's uh, animals um, that that have been uh, made out of hedges, um, classic stately home thing. But he thought they were goofy. He also thought it would be an absolute nightmare to try and do them, although in the 80s you very easily could have done the effect. He wasn't interested. He, he thought it was a bit too basic, from what I can tell. But he came up with the idea of a hedge maze, and he did this when he had moved uh, into his uh, into a second, or possibly third, more remote country location. He moved into a country manor called Chillickbury. Uh, for Americans, that is written Childwickbury. English pronunciation, not always reliable. And interestingly, Chillickbury was surrounded by a massive hedge. Now that helped Kubrick get the sort of privacy and seclusion that he wanted to enable in order to focus on his work. But I wonder if those massive hedges surrounding his property at Chillickbury inspired the hedge maze in The Shining. You know, you also have to ask, does a Colorado lounge, that massive Colorado lounge set, and it's hard to believe it's a set, fit into the lodge that we were shown from the outside? Again, it's the impossible geometry, you have to ask this. Uh, you also see all the Native American art that uh, Wendy just commented on. That feeds into a theory that The Shining is commenting on colonialism. Maybe we'll uh, discuss that a little bit later, but it's certainly one of the popular interpretations. And there's a fair bit of evidence for it. But um, I don't want to mention that right now. At this point, we need to talk about the uncanny. There are Grady's daughters. They're doubles. This is that doppelganger effect, but not just doppelgangers. They are two girls who are eight and ten who have been forced to mimic each other. They're meant to look close to each other, but they don't. They're not even true mirror images. Look, there, their hair is parted the same way rather than mirroring. So you don't have the symmetry that you're sort of expecting. It's just uneasy that they've been forced to look similarly. Now, after that pair of doubles, wait for it, uh, just coming up from those stairs, another pair of doubles, two blondes looking very similar to each other. There is a repetition of a repetition, two sets of doppelgangers. This is not intention. Uh, this is not accidental. That is 100% intentional. And it's something that Kubrick has built in to build up a sense of the uncanny. Additionally, there's been some great commentary on how the uh, apartment set here is also impossible. It cannot fit into the hallway that we were shown from the outside. You might wonder, how exactly does that window, which we know leads um, outside, faces outwards, when really it should be facing inwards uh, alongside all the other apartments? You can only really catch these details if you're sort of pausing and rewinding but it's just a subtle way to stop you really getting a strong sense of where you are in the hotel, for your brain to feel a bit uneasy about it all. We're also getting more Lontano played there. Again, I, I can't believe that is a set. It, it always, always baffles me. Now, as part of this, um, we just seen the maze there, but very interestingly, you will see... Uh, Wendy say that the hotel is a maze, she'll explicitly tell you it's a maze, which is going to feed into the interpretation a bit here. But for the moment, as, as well as seeing a certain amount of foreshadowing and setup, like the snow cat, which you just saw there, we're about to go into the gold room, we've uh, just passed by the maze, we're getting a lot of setup at this point. At this moment, um, when we're just about to meet Halloran for the first time in a way very familiar to Americans and completely new to Europeans, if you've never seen this cut before, I found that very interesting. Um, very weird watching a film that you know so well suddenly have scenes that you've never seen before. I found it quite disorientating myself. At this point, um, I think I'll talk about that Indian burial ground trope. Because we just had a mention of it by Ullman, mentioned that uh, the hotel was built on an Indian burial ground. Now that is a nod to classic horror tropes, classic Stephen King trope. You might be thinking of Pet Cemetery there, which I have also done a commentary for. And I think precisely because it's a trope, 
Kubrick didn't really want to use it, but he threw it in there, I gather, as a bit of a nod to sort of placate Stephen King while they were trying to work together a bit better. But ultimately, that relationship did not really work well. So let's maybe talk about that writing process, that selection, and how he came to differ from Stephen King. Now, Kubrick has got a very unusual method of selecting stories that he will adapt. When you look across his career, it is uh, massively disparate what he covers, and he really tends not to cover the same thing twice. I think about the closest you're going to get is a war in Full Metal Jacket, uh, which followed The Shining, and Paths of Glory, but then you're talking, say, the um, a very dramatic story of um, World War I versus um, an incredibly, I would say, almost nihilistic, much more modern tale, a uh, much more cynical tale in Full Metal Jacket, so they really are very different. Kubrick looked for information everywhere. He really didn't want to fall into a box. He didn't want to limit himself. He had this really interesting habit of seeking out all kinds of information. If you read any any biographies of him, I'd, I'd strongly recommend John Baxter's biography. You will get so many uh, conversations. Uh, you'll get so many people pointing out that conversations with Stanley Kubrick would just range over everything just all over the place, random, uh, just total random selections of things he was interested in. And he would also try and expose himself uh, to a certain amount of randomness in what he'd come across. So I really love the story of him going into bookstores, secondhand bookstores, and just taking things off the shelf without looking what they were. He wanted to, I guess, take the blinkers, take the limiters off him, and uh, really open himself to the widest possible source of interest. Now, that is not what happened here. The Shining, I think, is a rather interesting but kind of indicative case for him. Kubrick, I believe, was very motivated by the success of The Exorcist, uh, which sort of um, got the Oscar wins that he didn't get when he was making A Clockwork Orange. And I think he was really driven by this. You can see in Stanley Kubrick a little bit of a desire to chase success, but also a desire not to follow the crowd. It's quite a tension in his uh, in his career. And something else that also blew my blew my mind was that Stanley Kubrick was offered the chance to direct The Exorcist uh, before Will, William Friedkin got it. Uh, he was subsequently offered uh, to direct. Exorcist 2 and 3. Obviously, he uh, he didn't do it. Would he have done a better job than John Borman? I leave that up to you. But overall, Kubrick didn't have an interest in horror. He wasn't making this uh, for the typical reasons you would do a horror movie, which is, say, uh, you're early on in your career and you want to make something cheap that you know will sell well. Um, he didn't do that. His version of that was a cheap exploitation boxing uh, gangster movie called Killer's Kiss, something he's not particularly proud of, but he was making it when he just needed to get used to the craft, work with a bigger budget, the biggest budget he could get his hands on, and sell something. So he made his little exploitation movies in the uh, gangster area. But horror, he wasn't really interested in. However, following the success of The Exorcist and its Oscar-winning success, I should point out, he wanted to prove himself, I believe. As he said, he wanted to make the best horror film. And I think it's a he's made a fair play for it here. The way The Shining has come to be revered in critical circles, he's done a good job of it. Now, Kubrick was shown the manuscript for The Shining before it was published in 1977, and I think that's that's why he went for it. He knew that Stephen King was rising. He knew it would have a good chance of commercial success. But he didn't take it as a direct adaptation. Obviously, this is recognisably The Shining. But every time he adapts something, Stanley Kubrick is very free in removing what he doesn't think is interesting. He never likes to start a story fresh. He likes to take someone else's work and adapt it very freely. But in doing so, he runs across an extremely different understanding of horror and understanding of The Shining to Stephen King. 
I'm just going to quote you here from uh, John Baxter's book. Kubrick saw the book in an entirely different light. This was Jack Torrance's story and everything else, in particular the supernatural element, was peripheral. Some critics have assumed that Kubrick saw himself in Torrance and that the story of a man who, who immures himself with his family in a remote country retreat was autobiographical. But his true inspiration was Stephen Crane's story, The Blue Hotel. The Blue Hotel, says Kubrick, suggested the psychological misdirection of The Shining. He saw Torrance as a man like the Swede in search of his own distraction, who surrenders to the imagined horrors of the hotel in order to rid himself of his troublesome family and finally to destroy himself. Jack's decline into paranoia and homicidal mania was a textbook illustration of Kubrick's Manichean belief in evil as a force that can be embodied, the entity Michael Hare called the Shadow. If there was to be evil at the Overlook, it was within Torrance, not in a telepathic six-year-old, nor an ambulant shrubbery, which would, moreover, be ruinously expensive to create. I think that is uh, very telling. Now, King obviously did not like this. Uh, to quote Stephen King, Kubrick just couldn't grasp the sheer inhuman evil of the Overlook. So he looked instead for evil in the characters and made the film into a domestic tragedy with only vaguely supernatural overtones. That was a basic flaw because he couldn't believe he couldn't make the film believable to others. The real problem is that Kubrick set out to make a horror film with no apparent understanding of the genre. Everything about it screams that from beginning to end. Well, obviously, I'm going to disagree massively with that. Um, and there's also there's also a really strong history, even when Stephen King is writing that in uh, 1982. There is a strong history of directors making one horror film and never touching the genre again and making an absolute classic. I will point, obviously, to Richard Donner making The Omen, or Bob Clark making Black Christmas. There is a, there's a bit of a trend of that in horror, so it's a, it's a daft comment from Stephen King, if I'm honest. I don't want to paint this as a sort of constant feud. Uh, King does have some nice stuff to say, so also from Don's Macabre, Kubrick is a director who shows an almost exquisite sensitivity to light and shadow. There are an awful lot of things about that movie that I think are flawless and beautiful. But he also said, When a director such as Stanley Kubrick makes such a maddening, perverse and disappointing film as The Shining, it somehow retains a brilliance that is inarguable. It is simply there. So it's a little more nuanced than him just hating it. Stephen King just sees a fundam fundamentally incompatible vision. And I think he is at base correct. They do look at things in a very different way. It's been summed up as uh, Stephen King wrote a story about a haunted hotel and Stanley Kubrick made a film about a haunted man. I think that's a, that's a fairly fair summation. But it goes deeper than that. The sort of criticism of Stephen King as uh, writing a book about a lamp monster, I think really shows in that. I think it's in a way, it's a, it's a much more superficial version of horror if it's literally an evil hotel, or in the case of 1408, an evil room, or an evil shopkeeper. It's very isolated, um, and I think it would be fair to say, effectively, Stephen King is writing a left-wing version of horror. That is, the source of the horror is something concrete and external, and something that can be fought. So you can uh, burn the Overlook Hotel down, and then you're fine, there will never be a recurring Torrance. If Grady had burned down the hotel, then the Torrances would have been fine. Whereas Stanley Kubrick is much more pessimistic, and I would say a greater observer of human nature, in that he is saying the evil is within. It's a constrained vision. You can't just burn down the hotel, you can't just burn down the shop, you can't smash the ancient relic, and everyone will be fine. You can't just have an environmental intervention that fixes everything, because humans are fundamentally flawed. I wouldn't go so far as to say it's a right-wing version, but I would say that understanding of humanity aligns with right-wing thought, and also uh, is very aligned with what Thomas Sowell called the uh, constrained vision, uh, a vision where when you're wanting to make plans, you have to consider the essential fact that humans are deeply inherently flawed. You have to factor that into a decision making. 
You know, just looking at this now, how odd is it to see a hotel empty? It's another aspect of the uncanny. Usually a hotel is meant to be packed with people. It feels very wrong for it to be empty. Now, as we're also, uh, I'll carry on with that uh, type of horror analysis, but I just want us to enjoy the steady cam work here, following Danny around. Kubrick is able to do this because of the sheer size of the set he built. It's the it's the form of the set sort of very much uh, creating its own, uh, I guess, necessitating the kind of filmmaking he's doing. But also let's notice, uh, as we're talking types of horror, the Overlook looks like a real hotel. The research was done on location to make sure it really looked like a hotel and it's brightly lit. Kubrick isn't giving himself the kind of evil lamp monster tropes that he could use. The Overlook isn't giant and sinister and shadowy. It is giant and sinister, but it's it's brightly lit. He is having to work a lot harder to unsettle you using devices like you focusing on Jack Nicholson in a mirror, seeing a flipped version of his face where it's obviously Jack Nicholson, but he looks a bit wrong. Um, the use of the mirror flipping uh, images will uh, continue throughout the movie. And there's a deeper aspect to it, really, uh, seeing someone's um, darker side, their alternate version of the self, the self that they repress. Pretty much any time someone is talking to a ghost in this movie, there is a mirror that they are looking at or a reflective surface, as if they are just talking to themselves. Keep an eye out for that. But it's also the uncanny and settling effect of seeing someone's face but seeing a bit wrong. Um, to trivialise it, on your phone you probably have a, um, a camera on the front and a camera on the back. The one that faces you will flip the image like a mirror so it is used to what you, uh, so it's like what you see when you look in a mirror and the camera on the back will not flip it. And the reason the selfie camera is uh, mirror style is just because we find looking at our non-flipped faces a little bit unsettling. It all looks a bit wrong. I also want to point out that that reveal that what you think is regular reality is actually in a mirror was also used by Christopher Smith's Triangle, a film I absolutely adore from 2009. Very, very inspired by The Shining. Here is, a, here is a, another interesting piece. People have made a lot of that typewriter uh, being the Adler, some people have tried to read uh, references to um, the mid-century Germans and the Third Reich into The Shining. I do not buy any of those, I'm afraid. But if uh, if you do, then the use of an Adler or an Eagle, uh, which is frequently recurring in fascist imagery, is kind of helpful. Now, you look, you, what I want you to notice about that typewriter is that it was white. Because that typewriter will not stay white, but... We'll come on to it later. Is that a mistake or is that just meant to unsettle you? I leave that to your judgment. I think uh, the helicopter shadow is probably the only mistake we had in this movie. I think the rest is deliberate, but I leave it up to you. As they're wandering around the maze here, uh, which, by the way, caused much hilarity for the crew as people inevitably got lost in it, try as they might, that was a real massive maze that they built on set. And uh, people got lost in it when they were filming. You know, try as you might, it's going to happen. Even little maps do not help you. <laughs> um, I'll also point out that given that the maze isn't there, as you saw from the outside, um, you maybe won't be surprised to know that the shape of the maze changes a lot. Again, that is that inconsistent geometry that is meant to unsettle you, uh, feel uncanny. Um, that music from Bella Bartok, that is music for strings, percussion and Celeste movement three, uh, also feeling eerie. Now, as they're lost in the maze, look at how we just faded into Jack. Lost in the hotel. Remember, Wendy told you the hotel is a maze. We're going to really cement that here. The way Wendy and Danny got lost, fading into Jack lost. He is now going to overlook them pun uh, very intentional there and we're going to get an instant transition to actually looking over the real maze from the model and often it would take you a while to notice that you've gone on to the real version but again 
that surprise that, oh, I'm not looking at the model, I'm looking overhead at Wendy and Danny, it's to unsettle you. So you're not quite sure what you're looking at here. But that is fantastic editing. Absolutely fantastic editing. We'll, we'll talk more about the camera work and editing later. And to further unsettle you, as happened previously, we are going to do a smash cut to another title card before Wendy and Danny get out. Again, you are denied resolution. You are kept off balance by this film. This is a kind of technique that is uh, much more subtle that Kubrick uses, I think, to great effect. Now, back onto the topic of different types of horror, we, we discussed how Kubrick has a complete different vision than King. King did have the opportunity to write a script. He actually had a contractual right to get that first script, but Kubrick refused to read it. So I don't know if King actually completed one that he would later go on to use in the, I think, 1997 adaptation that he did uh, almost to spite Kubrick because he wanted to do a faithful version, as he called it. Um, but Kubrick did not use that script. Instead, as he did many times throughout his career, he brought in a co-writer. Now, he had done this from the earliest days. Kubrick not only didn't like to make his own stories, he never liked to write alone. And this did cause some tension over credits. Uh, you know, who got the screenwriting credit for a film? There's quite a lot of drama over that over the years. Um, but he brought in a woman called Diane Johnson, who was a lecturer, a researcher in Gothic horror. And through that, they looked at Freud. They looked deep in the psychology of everything and tried to go really deep on what made things horrific. And I think through that, he also decided to basically leapfrog over Stephen King and use uh, Shirley Jackson as a source of inspiration. Uh, it might seem unlikely, but maybe I'll, ha I think I'm going to have to talk about this later because this is interesting, but I'll talk about Shirley Jackson and her influence on The Shining later because it is very significant. Now, there is the iconic Room 237. It's already been mentioned before. What I think we saw in the conversation with Halloran is that he was levelling with Danny, talking about the ability to shine, but he didn't know how strong Danny's ability was. He was trying to put him off. He was trying to placate him. So when Danny keeps digging at the saw, Halloran was not happy and then tries to warn him off. But I think because of that knowledge of humanity, that constrained vision, we can't ignore it. If we're told we can't do something, you know, for instance, uh, eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I don't know, random example there, we are going to give it a go. We are going to have to. Digging at that saw, Danny just gets a flash. It's building it up for us. It's a repetition. We're wondering what the heck are those twins? Now, we followed Danny with the Steadicam to room 237. But look now, we don't follow him. We lose him. He cycles away from us. We've stayed with room 237, which we've had established as sinister. And then from there, with that wonderful Bella Bartok music still going, we've gone to Jack more enthrall to the hotel. It's a, it's a feeling that the hotel is more in control. We stayed with room 237 and from there we go to Jack, dwarfed by the hotel. Look how tiny he is in the light of everything else. We should also notice that the music you heard while Danny was riding around there was the same music from when they were lost in the maze. Again, reinforcing the Overlook Hotel itself is a maze. It is a labyrinth. Now here on the table is a really interesting item. That is the scrapbook. You may not have heard of it. By the way, watch that chair behind Jack. Keep an eye on that. The scrapbook, it doesn't get talked about, but it is a, a vestigial element of the movie. It was originally part of a much more subtle Faustian bargain that Jack makes with the hotel. By the way, check out that typewriter. It's switched. It is now dark. Is there anything deliberate in that? Is it to throw you off? Is it a continuity error? Is it moving from a white typewriter to a dark as a hotel has gained influence? You know, Jack has gone from writer's block to being inspired by the hotel and now he can write, but the influence is dark. Is that in there? Maybe. The scrapbook, as I said, is vestigial. There was a scene where Jack, doing his duties, discovered it in the basement. 
and it contains all sorts of news clippings that were put together by a journalist called Alexander Walker, who Kubrick was familiar with, and Walker was tasked with filling the entire book with things that sort of told the history of the Overlook, filled in some blanks and made a sort of ominous thing. And Walker, to his credit, was very astute and said all the articles had to be real. They had to be convincing, they had to be complete clippings, because people would freeze frame it, as he called it, and then be able to read everything. So it couldn't just be a headline. If you get interested in a movie, try try just when you see a newspaper clipping, see if it if the prop pays out, if they actually put the effort into making an actual article, or if they just did a uh, headline and hoped you wouldn't check. So Jack was meant to find the scrapbook and that would break his writer's block. As he said when Wendy brought him breakfast, he has lots of ideas, no good ones. Now he's able to write and it was meant to be the scrapbook, which was the pivotal thing that allowed that. It was his deal with the devil. Now, there is an alternate version of that, that now, that now basically happens in the gold room when he talks to Lloyd the bartender. But this sight of the scrapbook, do you notice the chair come and go there? Again, continuity error or a decision to try and throw you off with editing. She also point out that uh, right here is a heck of a lot of colour correction. Uh, this looked very yellow on set because of the lights. They couldn't get around it. So everything was looking quite yellow. The fog was looking yellow, but it's colour corrected. This shot, I love. This, I believe, is inspired by Black Christmas. That might sound odd, but that turtleneck, that stare, that hairstyle looks a heck of a lot like Kia DeLay's character in the 1974 horror film Black Christmas. And why would Stanley Kubrick have seen that when he's not interested in the genre? Well, he might have seen it because Kia DeLay, who he had cast in 2001 A Space Odyssey, was in it. He might have checked it out for that reason. We certainly know from the making of The Shining that he keeps in touch with old actors. Uh, so James Mason, who was in Lolita, visited the set. Quite, a, quite an interesting scene that made it through to the documentary, uh, as I said, done by his daughter. The uh, idea that people refused to work with Kubrick again, had bad relations with him, you know, I think we should challenge that. Certainly some people did. Uh, Harvey Keitel stormed out of Eyes Wide Shut after being made to walk through a door and enter a room 28 times. Um, at the time, he was, uh, you know, his interviews have him saying there was a sort of clash of visions and availability. Um, but Gary Oldman gave an interview saying that Harvey Keitel had just said he flipped out after having to do 28 takes. <laughs> uh, I'm inclined to believe Gary Oldman. There's something that inhibits a lot of understanding of cinema is the fact that everyone has to maintain working relationships. Kubrick, not so much. By, by moving himself to England, he really did put himself outside of the Hollywood system a lot. And I believe that was very deliberate. Early on his, in his career, he got very screwed over by the studios. When he had little influence, he was bullied around, he was taken advantage of. I'll highlight Kirk Douglas as a good example. He did not have a good experience making Spartacus. And I think he learned from that and decided that independence was absolutely crucial to him. Hence why he didn't want to travel. He wanted everything done near him. Uh, he even edited The Shining in a converted stable at Chilitberry. He also arranged a rather large promotion for uh, the editor of this film. Uh, he went through two previous editors, but he couldn't get on with them. He's, um, he's an interesting man to work with, evidently. The original two editors for The Shining were Ray Lovejoy and Jill Smith, but they were not able to get on with uh, Stanley Kubrick's working style, which was very demanding and also at very odd hours, and they quit. And so this gave an opportunity for a junior editor by the name of Gordon Stainforth. Moving on from that, we're once again following Danny, but this is a really interesting, different way. Danny now is getting away from us. He is, we're still using a steady cam, but he is going ahead. We've lost track of him and we'll lose sight of him. But now we're going to jump cut to him suddenly. We're back in control. We're feeling a bit secure, uh, comfort comfortable that we know where Danny is when suddenly we are hit with this. It's a trick of the editing and the camera work to throw you off. It is 
wonderful directing, wonderful editing, and incredibly creepy. It was always going to be an iconic scene with this amazing imagery, but I just want to highlight how the camera work and editing reinforce it to make it so effective. Now listen to that. Come and play with us forever and ever and ever. We've already had built in a little subtle hint about uh, recurrence of a sort of always being here, always being in the hotel that will come into play in the final reveal of the film. And this is new. This is brand new from Kubrick. It is not in Stephen King. Kubrick is doing something very interesting. And he is getting that from Shirley Jackson, from her novel The Haunting, which has that element of predestination. But keep an eye out for that. It's obviously meant to be creepy. It's laid on heavy in this. And he gets it from Jackson, not King. Although I should emphasise, Stephen King does appreciate Shirley Jackson. He loudly praises her. Um, and the uh, red rum, uh, that is obviously iconic for The Shining, that is also from Jackson. The haunt, in The Haunting, the uh, manor people stay in has different rooms. So the blue room, the green room, the red room. And the red room is obviously like red room. Uh, that is a point directly from King. It is not a reach from me. Stainforth had been working with Vivian Kubrick on cutting uh, the making of The Shining and was really quite a junior guy. But as I said before, Stanley Kubrick was very happy to promote people when they succeeded at opportunities to prove themselves. Let's uh, hear a little bit from Gordon Stainforth here. Stainforth's big moment came simply when a tannoy announced, will Gordon please come to the cutting room? Stanley wants him to do some cutting. And Stainforth recalls, it was a fantastic moment for me. I was so nervous and Stanley treated me just the way he probably treated Ray. Just gave me some instructions and walked out of the room. And that weekend worked really well. On Saturday evening, I had dinner with Stanley and Christiane. Uh, that's Kubrick's third wife, Christiane Harlan. And we kept cutting through Sunday. On Monday morning, Ray came in looking white with his arm in a sling. And I had a long meeting with Stanley. And that's when Kubrick said, Gordon will be cutting the rest of the film. It was one of the great moments in my life, but it caused a great deal of resentment in the lower echelons of the production. Because here was this man who had been until recently just a numbering boy, who had never worked on a feature film in his life and not even been an assistant, who becomes not even a first assistant, but is, in effect, the editor. What helps Stainforth there is not just his talent, but his ability to be 100% dedicated to The Shining. That is what Stanley Kubrick expected, and uh, the hours are quite incredible. Now we'll move on now here. There's a story that goes round about The Shining that... Uh, that Danny Lloyd didn't know he was in the horror film. I don't believe that for a second. Uh, watching The Making of The Shining, absolutely he knew, absolutely he was getting directions. And I've heard that same story about Harvey Stevens playing Damien in The Omen. That I believe a little bit more, but it's absolutely fake for Danny Lloyd. I think I mentioned this briefly, but I didn't fill it in. Now, Danny was cast by Leon Vitali who was going out there supervising some of the external shots that Stanley wouldn't do because he was insisting on staying in England. So Vitali, who had been an actor as Lord Bullingdon and would act again in later Kubrick films, uh, chiefly Eyes Wide Shut, um, stepped up to become a production assistant. And one of the things he was asked to do was to find Danny. Kubrick wanted uh, boys between uh, sort of five and six from the Midwest and Vitali went around auditioning 5,000 of them and narrowing 5,000 down to a few hundred that he would take videotapes of and then send them to Stanley Kubrick to approve. Kubrick obviously wanted the say, but Vitali is really interesting. He stays close to Kubrick hereafter. And Kubrick does contra the idea that people never want to work with him again, have a lot of people who stick with him. Certainly a lot of people storm off, but people like Leon Vitali, they stayed close and loyal to Kubrick throughout their career. And there's a lot of evidence that in some ways, to some people, Kubrick was incredibly loyal and to others, not so much. Now, this scene is incredibly unsettling. It's pivotal to Rob Agar's interpretation of the film as not being about ghosts, but about being abuse and sexual abuse of Danny by Jack. 
You notice that when Danny came in, the Jack we saw not sleeping was on the bed in the mirror and we saw the mirror version of Jack. That's, that's sort of leaning on that idea of the shadow self, the version of you that you don't want to see, the ultimate version of you. And they play this scene of nominally heartwarming dialogue so awkwardly, so stiltedly. It's deeply uncomfortable, this moment when they're just alone. Danny looks incredibly uneasy and Jack is not acting like himself. And these two characters who we should both know have the ability to shine. With Danny it's acknowledged, with Jack it's not. And I find that very interesting. That's often glossed over that Jack also has the ability to shine and that's where Danny gets it from. There's kind of a game being played here where they're testing each other out. Danny knows a heck of a lot more than he's letting on, but he's testing out his father. That's what I take most from the scene. Rob Agar points out that this is absolutely pivotal to the abuse reading because of how they're alone on the bed. Wendy isn't going to go there. Jack insists on bringing Danny closer. And after it, we're going to go pretty much straight into room 237. And room 237 in Agar's reading is much more of a symbol. It's a metaphor. It's not meant to be literal. We're going to see basically two different characters and their experience of room 237. And that is to be seen as symbolic of something. So I'll try and go over it when we get there. Now, aside from that, you should just bear in mind what we're seeing here and how Danny will appear very soon afterwards. How Danny and Jack will appear very soon afterwards, very shaken up. Danny has Jack reveal something interesting. He's going to do a repetition, activating the kind of uncanny horror that's not just accentuated by this very uncomfortable delivery, where it, it really does seem like there is a lot of irony going on, a lot of dramatic irony, basically like really heavily laying it on for the audience. So it's, it's like a threat. But you also had Jack saying he wanted to stay here forever and ever and ever. It's that repetition, setting it up for you. And now we're about to see, following that scene immediately, a representation of an encounter in room 237. There's going to be a ball rolling here. Where did it come from? Is it just a spooky ball? Is it an evil ball? Stephen King would write about an evil ball. Um, Kubrick isn't doing that. We last saw that ball in Jack's hands. That is something Jack was using, taking out his frustrations on the hotel, pounding it against the wall, throwing it against a uh, some Native American art and a buffalo head, which many people use quite extensively for their uh, interpretation of the hotel as being about uh, settling America. By the way, uh, Native American art to the left, a portrait of a sad young girl, a sad young Native American girl. You can look for that in the film if you like. It's not the reading I go for. We're now very much contra the steady cam. We are in Danny's POV here. We will see Jack's POV later. This is a bit of a standout in The Shining. So much of it has been done by steady cam, and it's been done that way because the set was built to allow it. This is a technology and format working together, but I'm getting distracted. The important thing is that ball was Jack's. It is now passed over to Danny. He was previously using it to take out aggression on the wall, and now it's gone to Danny. Jack will now be taking out his aggression on Danny. That is what is symbolised here. This reading might sound odd to some of you. I realise it's weird the first time you encounter it. Um, I found it fascinating. This is the basement set where Jack originally found the scrapbook that we talked about earlier. Uh, you'll notice now Wendy is just doing his job. And that's uh, what she's gotten used to. It's a subtle thing, but you see that she's just gotten used to taking it on. Now we sort of had a fugue, a fade out of what's going on in room 237. We do not see it from Danny's point of view. Probably mercifully, I would say. Oh, I love that music there. Again, you can do this great shot in Steadicam, you'll note, because of the set. But now Wendy 
is having a very external view of what's going on. She can't tell, but we're now going to see her just encountering it remotely. She is going to come to the action after the fact. There was a scrapbook on the table again. I do miss the scrapbook scenes. I think they were, they were subtler. It was a subtle way of doing the devil's bargain that Jack sort of goes for in order to undo his writer's block. Now what's going on here? We've just moved out of Danny's experience of Room 237, which as I've outlined is symbolic. Jack now, after the fact, is having a nightmare. So something he really doesn't want to see, something he doesn't want to face up to, something he wouldn't admit he's capable of, like for instance, the way he refuses to take responsibility for breaking Danny's arm. He won't acknowledge that he was drunk and aggressive and frustrated and really just hurt Danny because he was in, he was furious and out of control. Now for the abuse reading of the film, Jack is sort of coming to terms with what he did but unable to face it so he passes it off as a nightmare. Wendy is unaware of it. She has kept the sort of initial act of violence from three years ago. She's kept that down, she's managed that, but this is going to challenge her. She's going to struggle with this a lot more. Look at Danny now, we're following him very creepily, very unsettling. And we are wondering from this back view, what is he going to look like? We are kept wondering what his, what is happening with him because we can't see his face. Kubrick is just keeping us in suspense there. And now we find out. Not too much, though. He's sucking on his thumb, covering his mouth up. He's got damage to his neck. Is that meant to make you think of love bites? That sort of thing could be. But he's been very manhandled and he's acting absolutely traumatised. This is the kind of thing that Agar draws on. He also goes for a lot more deep symbolism. Uh, which I'm not sure how much I want to go into. Jack just dumbfounded there. Look at him. He doesn't know how to respond. He Has he been caught out? He might have been. He's going to go into deep denial after this. But Rob Agar will point to things like the clothing Danny is wearing, which has a rocket, a kind of phallic shape, pointing up towards his mouth. Later, the next time when Danny is going to be shining, we are going to see him shaking on a bed, traumatised and uh, kind of dribbling out of his mouth. And Agar uses those elements to um, draw inferences about the kind of abuse that Jack inflicted on Danny. I apologise if this wasn't the kind of um, interpretation that you wanted. You don't have to go with it, but I think it's one that's quite convincing. Here, I want you to pay attention to when Jack freaks out. There. And going along... He's going to do it again, passing the mirror. Whenever he passes the mirror, he freaks out. It's the idea of accountability. He doesn't want to see himself. He doesn't want to acknowledge. He can't face up to it. If he is now haunted about what he did, he's going to try and avoid the responsibility now. So he goes into the gold room. And I really should talk about the use of classical music at some point. It's also interesting that because it's classical music, it wasn't timed to Jack's performance. That had to all be done from the editing. You'll see a few instances of this where the performance has clearly had to be edited to match the classical music. And you wonder, how did they manage to do that? They partially did it because Kubrick had so many takes. He had a huge amount of material to work with. And he managed to find one where he could time it against classical music. But the music was chosen after the ed after the filming was done. Um, I'll talk about that filmmaking in a bit. It, it really does make the success of the film even more astounding. Now here's a devil's bargain that we did get. Jack just saying before this, I'd give my soul for a glass of beer. And then immediately, there's Lloyd. Infuriatingly, in the otherwise excellent John Baxter 
a biography of Kubrick that I uh, that I read in preparation. He calls Lloyd Clyde a very basic mistake. Anyway, Lloyd there is played by Joe Turkle, who is a returning Kubrick veteran. He was in Pass of Glory. He was also in The Killing. It's kind of a joy to see him, to be honest. He gets to play a very restrained character here, very restrained indeed. And it just plays off against this manic performance that Jack is giving. Jack Nicholson was Kubrick's main choice for this, but he was also, you may not know, uh, Kubrick's choice for another film that he wanted to do. He was trying to make Napoleon for a long time. Uh, He invested a lot of time and energy into the research for that. He drove off a couple of researchers, drove them mad with his requests. The aforementioned T-boy who was promoted to a senior production assistant, um, he was doing a lot of scouting around in France for that, uh, buying up as many artefacts from Napoleon's life as he could. But uh, ultimately, studios would not back that movie and uh, Kubrick frustratingly had to shelve it. But, uh, But Jack Nicholson was his number one choice to be Napoleon. I don't know how you feel about that yourself. I found it very interesting. There's a really interesting statement there. Here's to five miserable months on the wagon. And the line actually gets cut there for um, European viewers. A lot of this scene is really cut down for the European version. But that line, five miserable months. If you're paying attention, I believe that is pretty much Jack telling us straight out he's been cheating on the booze. Wendy says that he stopped drinking pretty much straight after the accident, which, as Jack tells us, was three goddamn years ago. Now, he wants to put time between himself and the accident, so maybe he's exaggerating. Maybe Wendy wanted to make it seem to the psychiatrist that uh, the stop of drinking had come a lot sooner, so maybe she exaggerated. But either way, somewhere between three years when the injury to Danny happens and uh, Jack breaks his arm, sorry, dislocates his shoulder and five months since he had a drink, somewhere in there, you've got the indication that Jack had been lying, and Jack had been boozing away. Interesting stuff. A subtle clue that Kubrick put in. A lot of the interpretation of The Shining um, that I don't find particularly helpful, as I've mentioned earlier, is the idea of it as a misogynist film, exploring misogyny. I do not go for that at all. I don't think, say, Wendy is underwritten in the least. Um, And a section where she is performing a, how can I say, uh, maybe uncharacteristically weird or goofy bit was very deliberate. And I believe it's used for a different point purpose rather than saying, you know, Wendy's an idiot, women are idiots. I don't think Kubrick's doing that in the least. But perhaps inevitably, a lot of the recent commentary, um, I have a book called Kubrick's Total Cinema from 2011 and a mid-2000s re-release and update of Stanley Kubrick, director. Both of those focus quite heavily on uh, an idea of The Shining exploring misogyny, picking up on Jack's language, you know, calling her a bitch, uh, referring to Wendy as the old sperm bank or... Uh, an interpretation of his experience in Room 237 as a kind of misogynist one where he follows his instinct and then feels a a lot of shame uh, at what he's done, sort of that he's demonising a woman he slept with and then feels shame about. Or the idea that everything has to be done on a sort of patriarchal man's decision. Uh, so the way Grady advises him is the patriarchy in action. I don't go for it at all. I'm afraid I find it very boring, but um, if you're going to read a lot of commentary and analysis about The Shining, you will probably discover that stuff, but I don't think it's a fruitful uh, line to pursue because, as I said, I don't view Wendy as underwritten. I don't view her as cast as any kind of bimbo. I think she's sympathetic and complex. I also note that the child psychiatrist is a woman, So a position of great authority has been given to a woman there. And on top of that, I'll also point out that Kubrick's daughter, Vivian Kubrick, uh, was entrusted to do a a look at this. Like there isn't any subconscious misogyny there because Kubrick trusted her and gave her a chance to do something quite, quite special, gave her 
unprecedented access to his filmmaking, which is incredibly helpful to us now when uh, when we see some snippets of what was happening during the making of this film. So that's something I, I feel I want to focus on there. And I didn't say this when Joe Turkle was on screen playing Lloyd, but uh, obviously uh, Jack is facing a mirror when he was talking. So once again, it's a, it's when someone is talking to a ghost, they are talking to a mirror, which is Kubrick giving himself the opportunity to give you a natural explanation, a psychological explanation for what's going on uh, in contrast to the supernatural one that you're eventually forced into. Now, I did mention how there was a huge amount of footage available uh, but uh, from which to do the editing, but I think I'll take a quick diversion at this point. I've heaped a huge amount of praise onto Rob Agar, which is much deserved for his analysis of The Shining. And if you're looking for Shining analysis, he really is someone you have to look at. But I do think somewhere that he tends to go astray is in his analysis of subliminal imagery sometimes. So for instance, he has a recent bit of analysis about subliminal hags in uh, Halloran's story. So here is Scatman Crevers as uh, Dick Halloran. And there was a suggestion that the black ladies who are topless on his posters, that they are indicative of a subliminal hag. So priming you for the hag who is in room 237. Personally, I, I find it very hard to see the link. I think the eeriness here is purely from the fact that he's experiencing a premonition. But he won't encounter the hag himself. He will only see it through shining. So I've got to say that's one of the areas where I felt Agar's analysis is perhaps reaching a little bit, uh, even though I respect him greatly. Now, we're also noticing in this, we are getting no dialogue. We're about to go back to room 237 and we're going to get Jack's experience. Now, look, that could have been exactly Danny's view. Is it Danny's view? Is it Jack's? There's a little uncertainty over that. There's also that shot of Danny with the dribbling from his mouth, which can uh, fuel some interpretations. Within room 237, look at the colour scheme. Green and purple is a classic kind of clashing colour scheme you use to uh, insinuate strangeness and oddness. Uh, Marvel comics will use this a heck of a lot with that combination. They look odd. You'll notice we are once again in first person view, just as when Danny went in. So this is an extremely subjective view that we are getting. We're really outside of the objective. So this is all experience. This is all interpretation, which helps when we know that this is to be viewed symbolically. But the fact that we get Jack's hand there pushing the door open um, is really quite unusual for the shot. It should make it stand out for you because usually we would just sort of glide through on steady cam as we have for most of this. Something massively standing out for me in this scene, and I meant to mention it earlier, look how sparse it is, no dialogue. Now, Kubrick, interestingly, is quite quite known for removing dialogue. He really doesn't like it. <laughs> Not just as a great admirer of, of silent films, but he gained an interest in trying to tell as much of the story without dialogue as possible. He would go through, remove huge tracts of it, huge speeches, and rely on people to convey things far more subtly, far more obliquely. When you know this, you start seeing that in all his movies. The refusal to give dialogue, to, uh, to explain things more easily, it keeps it more ambiguous, and he was definitely interested in ambiguity. Now, this is absolute primal imagery here. If you are going with a, the sort of sexual abuse reading, this is Jack out of a sort of desperation, seeing what he wants, going for it. And then when he sees the mirror, he comes to an awareness of what he's actually been doing. So in this case, it will be abusing Danny, seeing himself abuse Danny. He is unable to handle it. You can take that reading Another reading that I like is that this is just really primal. You know, this this woman is unnamed. She is just the female and she's archetypically female. You know, she is just showing her full form. She is receptive. She's taking a more passive role. She will be asking Jack to lead. She will be inviting him. 
look how she's looking to him for approval. She's really sort of trying to evoke him to be more masculine. That's interesting. But for Jack, what does she represent? He's going to see this extremely attractive woman, something he absolutely desires, who he just wordlessly, um, wordlessly starts approaching and kissing because everything is natural. It's uh, the male and the female coming together. But he's going to now realise a mistake. He's going to be encountering the truth, looking in the mirror and be disgusted. Now, what could be going on there? Outside of the abuse reading, what he might be seeing there is a feeling of regret. It's his experience of marrying Wendy, maybe getting her pregnant unintentionally, and now being stuck with her. This is kind of his hatred of Wendy now. Not the young woman that he hooked up with, but basically a crone. This is all about him detesting her. Or it could just be a lot more literal and about a ghost in a bathtub, Stephen King style, but I think Kubrick wouldn't have done it if it weren't a lot more interesting than that. Now, I'll also note that those shots we got of the hag rising out of the bath, those are straight out of Henri-Georges Clouseau's uh, Le Diabolique from the 1950s. If you haven't seen that, it is absolutely wonderful. Um, great piece of work. Um, now, in that, I believe the corpse in the bath rises from a different angle, but I, I do not believe for a second that Kubrick was not doing it deliberately. It's a quite explicit imagery as well in a film that is otherwise relatively tame. That amount of nudity, I think, is still quite shocking. But um, something that stood out to me when I got this film on 4K so I could uh, do the research, see it as clear as possible and get access to the American cut was that it had been recently downgraded from a uh, 18 certificate in Britain to a 15. And I find that very weird. I mean, the film has stayed the same. No content has changed. But by the way, look at that mirror once again. You're always going to get the mirror shots telling you that Jack is not being truthful here. Wendy is getting fed a pack of lies, even though Jack is going to be nominally a bit more supportive. I've also wondered about that wallpaper. There's a famous story called The Yellow Wallpaper about a woman who is locked up to treat mental illness and she starts seeing things moving beneath the wallpaper and then turns on her family. I've always wondered if that was something we were meant to take from the wallpaper, specifically in their room. But again, that could be a reach. Although I would not be surprised if Stanley Kubrick had read that story and taken it as an influence. As I was saying... I find it quite odd that the film would get downgraded from an 18, even though it hasn't changed. The idea that society has moved around it and it's now fine. I found that quite disconcerting from the ratings agencies. If you were to do Psycho today, honestly, I think that film would get a PG, uh, where it was originally obviously an X certificate in 1960. And then when I was buying it on VHS and well, you don't need to know, but um it was then reduced to a 15. And when you think about it, the, the Shining really isn't as extreme as we get in an 18 now, but nevertheless, I'm thrown off a little bit by it. Here, Jack has sort of processed what's going on. He's come up with a cover story. He's blaming Danny, saying Danny did it to himself. Really particularly sickening when you consider... When you consider the abuse reading, Jack now trying to be logical and gaslight uh, Wendy into it. Kubrick may not have been interested in monsters jumping at you from out of the closet or sort of graphic decapitations, but he was interested in doing something extremely unsettling, extremely disconcerting, just horrific. The idea of this is what a parent would do, but expressing it symbolically. Here's Danny lying in bed listening to his mum being gaslit and picking up of things are only going to escalate. That's why you're seeing the red rum, which as we mentioned, is uh, inspired by the red room from Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House. This is a much deeper horror, a much, much deeper horror. And here, Wendy is actually showing some kind of 
initiative here, saying we should leave. She's being rational. She's being sensible. But you see why she doesn't. She's caused Jack to flip. He is way too deep in now. Would he be worrying about what Danny might say in the outside world? It could be. Could be. It just, I find it absolutely absurd that Jack Nicholson is praised for his performance, but Shelley Duvall was initially slapped with a Razzie for it. You know, she is put upon. Uh, Jack, just looking at the camera there, that's something that's been analysed quite a lot too, as a sort of unsettling, uncanny, uh, breaking of the fourth wall, just subtle, so you're not sure you saw it or not. Anyway, I think Wendy is just handling that perfectly. She, just because she isn't a girl boss, doesn't mean she's a bad character. In this situation she's put upon, we are understanding from Shelley Devell's excellent performance that she's a woman who's been broken down. She's tried to assert herself, but Jack is dominating her in this. And it's not a man, like a horrible patriarch thing. It's a Jack in particular thing. Now, that is not to say that Shelley Devell had an easy time on set. Not at all. I think I might go into something that uh, has to be talked about which is the shooting style and the stress it caused. There are some legendary tales about the making of The Shining and I'll cover them. Uh, so shooting began in May 1978, uh, scheduled for 17 weeks, and it went on for 14 months. Now, why was that? Um, it wasn't uncommon. This is something that happened a heck of a lot increasingly with Stanley Kubrick. By the time he was making Eyes Wide Shut, he just had Cruise, uh, Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman sign contracts that they stuck with the film until it was done. He didn't do any kind of uh, limit setting because by that time he knew himself. Uh, this, by the way, with the balloons, that is a new shot for European viewers. We don't have it. And Halloran's journey here is probably quite a good thing to talk over. Um, that was excluded as well. Um, when he got the feedback on the film that it was just too long, um, he was basically pressured to cut it down and Kubrick agreed. And he actually ended up sending a uh, chap, a certified approved Kubrick editor round on a bicycle around cinemas while the film was still showing in them to cut the prints into a shorter Kubrick approved cut which is what we would later get in Europe as the shorter release, removing about 25 minutes of footage. I, I just find that so weird, the idea of an editor on a bike going around and cutting the film. Now, why did we end up with this uh, as Jack goes to the gold room again? Let's, let's carry on talking about that. The gold room will be full now. Now, why did the production expand from 17 weeks to 14 months? A lot of it is to do with the writing method. Kubrick was incredibly fluid in his writing. He did not go with a set script. He, he had changed his writing style to become more flexible. And by the time he was doing Barry Lyndon, he was basically passing people a page torn out of the novel and saying, this is what we're doing today. In Clockwork Orange, he had been incredibly free with improvising but had realised that didn't work for him as much. So he brought up a bit more control and uh, made people go off the script, but he didn't iron the script down. I'm sad to say that we did just pass a little cameo from Vivian Kubrick sitting on the uh, couch. We may get a shot of her. She is on the couch nearest Jack Nicholson, wearing black headdress and a black dress. She was uh, 18 when this was filmed. And if you watch the making of documentary, you see a very brave Jack Nicholson flirting with a director's daughter. Not a move I would uh, have thought was particularly canny, especially when that director is Stanley Kubrick. Anyway, the script was very fluid. It was unfixed and Kubrick was reacting to what he was seeing on the set, still allowing a little bit of improvisation, but nowhere as near, near as much as he allowed on Clockwork Orange. Um, he had Diane Johnson, who was the co-writer, as mentioned before, on set with him, to help iron things out, but they were basically issuing new scripts daily. If you watch make the making of The Shining, uh, then you hear Jack Nicholson complaining about this 
how you would get different coloured scripts just so that you knew that everyone was on the same page and that they were coming out basically each day. He half jokingly, but basically seriously, says to Stanley Kubrick's mum, he doesn't even bother learning it the night before. He just sees what the script is that on the day. There you see Vivian Kubrick, just on the right there, on the right of the sofa, Jack dancing by her. So that massively added to the production time. Uh, there we see Philip Stone, another returning Kubrick character. You saw him last in uh, Clockwork Orange. And uh, you see him elsewhere as well. It escapes my mind at the moment, I'm afraid. In the course of a commentary, uh, things do slip your mind. So Kubrick and Johnson had discussed the book a month for a month before they even wrote, digging deep into the theory, reading Freud, as we said. And then they moved to writing just uh, scenes on cards where the only thing they put on was character's motivation. And once I'd laid that all down, broken the story into basically motivations and beats, they then started adding small amounts of dialogue and expanding from there. But as they were going, they were just constantly rewriting. And in the course of this, Kubrick was, say, was basically allowing some innovation, uh, trying out different things and going for many, many, many takes. And the reason Kubrick did this was that he liked to discover the film in editing. Uh, he would complete a huge amount of filming from as much as he could, improvising, uh, coming up with new ideas, and then he would take the film home to edit and find the film in it. He didn't use storyboards. He tried out just huge amounts of things, followed whims, and then if a whim was successful, he might have to reshoot a huge amount he was extremely particular. You've got this odd combination in Kubrick of someone who is so willing to go on whims, but at the same time retain a huge amount of control, to have random impulses, random influences by, say, just taking source material off books grabbed at random from bookshops, but at the same time to be so particular about how things are done that he would call up cinemas and complain to them, tell them off if they weren't exhibiting the exact aspect ratio that he had insisted upon. The man is fascinating and he is a contradiction. So in the course of feeling out the film, following interests and whims, he did many, many, many takes. Now, something I actually greatly dislike about him is that his excuse for doing hundreds of takes and cases uh, to the point where actors would be injured, actors would be stressed out. Um, Shelley Duvall in particular had a horrible time, basically nervous breakdowns doing this. Um, his excuse for that is that he only does retakes if actors haven't learned their lines. And that obviously does not hold up to any scrutiny whatsoever. Um, John Baxter also notes that this is quite a slander on the cast that he's working with. They are professionals. They knew their lines. Although perhaps it's harder to know your line if the director is issuing you a brand new script each day. But as part of the long number of takes, you also have a counter reaction, which is quite interesting. So when actors are finding out that they're having to take 50 takes of a scene and they know Stanley isn't going to stop after just a couple, they start to adjust their approach. So in the case of Jack Nicholson, Stanley liked him out of control. He liked really erratic takes increasingly. And Jack learnt this. So as an editor, a Gordon Stainforth recounts, um, and this is all drawn mostly, by the way, from the Stanley Kubrick archives and uh, John Baxter's biography. Stainforth said that he noted a kind of rhythm in uh, Nicholson's performance because he was seeing all the takes and like an obscene amount of film was used in this. But he saw all the takes and he was saying that Stanley, uh, sorry, Jack Nicholson would throw a huge amount of energy at the first 10 takes or so. Trying to please Stanley, trying to give him what he thought Stanley wanted. And he would get little bits of direction from Kubrick, but 
not as much as you would hope. Clearly, something wasn't there that he wanted. Actors would have to try and work this out. So Jack goes really hard for a few takes and then would tone it down a lot. As Daneforth said, he was pacing himself. And that's what you would do, right? If you knew you were going to take 50 takes, you would save your energy. And then after pacing himself for a while, he'd try another burst of high energy. Then he'd go weird, he'd go erratic. He'd just try and find out what Kubrick was after. And often the first few takes would be amazing. They might even be used. But Kubrick would keep going, I think partially because he wanted as many options as possible so that he could find the film in the edit through a process of discovery. Tom Cruise noted, interestingly, that when he was working on Kubrick with Eyes Wide Shut, Kubrick was still editing The Shining, still going back and tinkering with it. Absolutely fascinating to me. He had at that point, of course, moved all the footage into uh, his editing room, which were the converted stables at Chillockberry, so he could have true control over it because uh, he had lost some of his prints to fires and studio mismanagement. Another reason that Kubrick wanted as little to do with the Hollywood system as he could uh, get away with. And of course, one other thing that uh, caused delays was that the set burnt down. Yeah, that's, that's quite significant. He had been warned that this massive set he'd built, the high walls, uh, extending close to a huge barrage of lights, uh, was at risk. It was getting blooming hot in there. Try as you might, it got incredibly hot under the huge lights that they had there. And uh, yeah, one day the inevitable happened and the set caught fire. This, uh, that's an interesting one. The studio weren't happy with this. This was extremely far into the production that the set, uh, you know, didn't completely burn down, but a huge amount of it was uh, damaged in this fire. And they thought they were so close to it then that Stanley would work around it. The poor studios, they were booked out. They booked out long in advance and they had two films set to follow them. But uh, the, uh, one of which was Raiders of the Lost Ark, incidentally. Um, but Kubrick is not a man to be moved. He is not a man to uh, bow to other directors' commands. And his relationship at the time with Spielberg was not exactly great, which gets a bit fascinating when you consider that Spielberg would then take over uh, artificial intelligence uh, as Kubrick was trying to develop it for years. Um, but yeah, they didn't get on amazingly well. Uh, so even though Spielberg was desperate to get in there and start filming Raiders, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Kubrick does not bend for anyone else. And he insisted the set be rebuilt so that he could continue shooting for another couple of months. Uh, absolutely infuriating. Uh, while we're dabbing on Spielberg, I'll just add in an interesting story that uh, Vivian Kubrick, very passionate on the animal rights, uh, to her credit, had noted that all these snakes around in the temple scene weren't looking too good and she was worried that they were getting mistreated. She was certainly seeing a lot of dead snakes around on set. Unsurprisingly, with Harrison Ford and Karen Allen sort of kicking lots of snakes around on set and so many of them in there, they got injured. There were a lot of dead snakes around. Uh, Vivian Kubrick was not happy and reported it. Uh, the SPHCA, you know, despite their assurances that all was fine, obviously there was animal abuse happening on set. They got the production shut down and new procedures had to be uh, installed to make sure that the snakes were okay. So yeah, good on, good on Vivian. And Kubrick was not worried about sort of upsetting Spielberg with this and just dismissed it as, ah, eh, Spielberg's a jerk. I kind of like that story. We just had a bit of a presaging here um, to come back to the action of uh, Danny waking up, screaming about red rum. We're being set up for foreshadowing here. And now seeing that, again, Europeans don't have Tony taking the dominant side here. Tony speaking for Danny entirely, refusing to wake up and Wendy just being kind of helpless here. If you want to go with the abuse reading, then this would be the kind of shutting down and trauma response from Danny. How he's uh, basically, um, what's the phrase? He's distanced himself. He's disassociated. There you go. Disassociated. 
Anyway, in the midst of all this, as we're saying, huge takes, production dragging out for 14 months, um, Jack Nicholson stressed out of his mind. Uh, he had a bloody difficult time with this as well because his own personal life was quite thrown about. Um, I won't go into all of it, but something that had uh, obviously impacted him was that he owned, uh, he and Angelica Houston jointly owned a residence in in the Mulholland Drive area, sort of where a lot of the Hollywood celebrities are. And he wasn't using it, but he had let his good friend Roman Polanski use it. Roman Polanski was using Jack Nicholson's residence to take photos of very young girls at uh, the direction of the Hollywood magazine. And it was in that same residence where Polanski uh, raped a 13-year-old or a Maybe I should still say alleged. I don't feel like making that particular effort, to be honest. Uh, that's where that incident happened. Obviously, that shook Nicholson up. He was also partying a lot. So I think that um, uh, there is a reference in the John Baxter to the uh, making the Shining documentary, capturing the cast, uh, using a bit of motivational cocaine. Stanley Kubrick trimmed that out of the final product, but... I do wonder if that might have been uh, Jack, given his parting habits. He was very strung out, and these long shooting days, these huge number of takes were taking their toll on him as well. And something else that came up in the documentary, you note that Kubrick had started a habit of working later and later in the day. The start of that documentary is a working day beginning at about 8pm at night. 8pm at night, forget the tautology there, it's a long commentary. Jack's just being called into work then. He's just eaten dinner and the work is starting now. It's a closed set, so there is no need to start the work at 8pm. But Kubrick had started shifting out of alignment with basically time zones in the US and Britain. He was kind of working on his own international scale, I think trying to work a little bit more with America so he can keep an eye on developments there. He was incredibly incredibly hands-on and involved with everything to do with his films and I think he found that given the time zone the studios worked in he would start working later and later in night into the night and that meant that he insisted his British productions do the same thing you can see a lot of the crew on the making of are worn out by this and I think that's that's part of it so Nicholson's worn out by it um poor uh, Scatman Cravers, who was in his late 60s at this point, he was injured from falling down so many times. So, you know, that's absolutely brutal. Even though he, he he is very thankful for the experience, he isn't bitter towards Kubrick. He seems genuinely moved that he was able to take part in something great. And you massively respect him for that. And Nicholson, incidentally, brought him on from working with him on a One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, a little bit of trivia. People tend to focus on uh, Shelley Duvall when they talk about the impact on the cast, and she she certainly took it hard. In the footage, uh, you in the filmography footage, you can see Kubrick being quite harsh with her, uh, saying that her performance is un unconvincing, making her repeat stuff over and over again. She starts to lose hair, and he's quite unsympathetic. And I almost wonder that if, if what Kubrick was trying to do with the take for another reading of why he hit, you know, hundreds of takes for some things, particularly the scene where Jack is menacing Gwendy as they go up the stairs together. One interpretation I had was that it was almost like method directing. If he wanted Wendy to be absolutely stressed out as she's been increasingly over the course of the film, to be at the end of her tether, to be absolutely not coping anymore, why not do method directing and just get the actress to that state? Exhaust her, you know, get her strung out, make her absolutely desperate from doing hundreds of takes, and that way you will get an authentic performance. Um, it's the idea I have for method directing. Uh, I will also, um, I don't want to say accuse maybe, I'll, I'll apply that reading to William Friedkin in The Exorcist in my commentary of that as well. A similar case of the director just wanting the actors to experience something rather than trusting them to convey it as the characters they're meant to be playing. 
So I've often wondered that and wondered if he was trying to drive Nicholson into a sort of mania. If you think that sounds uncharitable, if you think I'm sort of slandering Kubrick there, people working with him, as I've indicated, have a mix of experiences. I promised I was going to talk about the classical music and I want to do that now. Kubrick increasingly started to rely on classical music, which was something he was extremely knowledgeable, extremely passionate about, and preferring that to scores that were written. I'm not exactly sure why, because you would have, how can I say, something's already been done. You're less in control when you use classical pieces. So maybe it's it's just his passion for classical music in particular, but he, he moved towards it. By the time he's doing The Shining, he's got a lot more directorial control, so it's not as contentious. But earlier on, particularly when he's making, say, 2001, the studios want him to use a big name composer and to have specifically composed music, because that's just the way that they do it. So on 2001, the composer who was nominated was a chap by the name of Alex North, Um, who was moved into London, moved into a studio-owned flat, very close to the studio so he could do his work, and he was given a fairly short time frame in which to produce the compositions for 2001. Kubrick was not interested in a special composition. He already wanted to use classical, but it was the studio's insistence, so... He lets Alex North do the work, he lets him rush, and Alex North, under the uh, time constraints, is pushing himself to the absolute limit. He stresses himself out so much that he has something of a breakdown, has to be taken to hospital. And nevertheless, he's under the thumb by Kubrick saying, you know, I need that, I need that music, I need it now. So it's rushed even further, all the pressure is on him, it must have been an absolute nightmare. You know, the fact that he is hospitalised and is brought to the studio in an ambulance should tell you about the kind of constraints that were on him. Nevertheless, Kubrick didn't use his music. And you feel that Kubrick never had any intention of using Alex North's music, but was simply going along with it so that he could say to the studios, look, I did what you asked, but ultimately it didn't work out. I have a feeling I might take a little bit of a moment to give you another story from 2001. I'll I'll give you one from uh, Clockwork Orange while I'm at it. Uh, Maybe you could call this method directing. Maybe it's just plain old sadism. But Malcolm McDowell being brought on to be um, Alex DeLarge, he had a terrifying fear of reptiles. And he comes to set one day and Stanley says to him, hey, Malcolm, I've got a surprise for you. And uh, shows him a snake, a massive tank with a snake and says, that's going to be yours now. So he has to do scenes right next to a snake he's absolutely terrified of in the bedroom. Fun little detail I got from uh, Stanley Kubrick archives, I believe. Now, we should talk about this very famous scene. Wendy finally uncovering the secret of what Jack's been working on this whole time. Having the wool ripped from her eyes, the scales falling from her eyes, I should say. And seeing that Jack has just been typing this non-stop, all work and no play, makes Jack a dull boy. This dawning realisation is amazing. Now, how did Jack, how did, uh, how did this get done? Did Stanley Kubrick make some poor intern type all of this out? Not quite, not quite. Um, This scene largely happened because Stanley had got access to a new electronic typewriter that he could program. And he programmed it to type this out. So he had come across an electronic typewriter, which means he could just automate it. He could program it. Kubrick was extremely interested in technology. He was no technophobe at all. And uh, that leads us on to the steadier cam, which we could definitely talk about in this scene. But anyway, uh, he programs the typewriter to do it so that no matter where Shelley Duvall flipped to, there would be something filled in, which gave him a bit of security when he's doing all these takes that you don't accidentally come across um, a blank page. Now, of course, he also set this up for the international version so that there is a French version of it, a German version of it, an Italian. He didn't want some kind of on-screen title to take you out of the experience. He wanted Italians, French people, Germans to just see the 
equivalent of that in their own language so they don't have to break out of the moment. I think that was an incredibly uh, smart decision. Much parodied moment, but legendary, absolutely legendary and sinister. It also feeds into the theme of someone's internal reality is not necessarily going to be the objective reality, something central to this version of The Shining. So as we talked about, 237 is not an objective experience. It is unique. It's um, it's Danny and Jack's interpretation of an event. Likewise, I'll be making the case that, you know, the labyrinth, the maze, it's not necessarily a real labyrinth. It's a lot more of what it represents, which is a sort of sense of insanity, of losing yourself. Anyway, uh, we should get back to that another time. Right now we're seeing an intensification of the horror, a move into um, escalation towards the climax, where Jack's just absolutely unlivable. This is that scene that was filmed over a hundred times, where everything has to come to a head. People take Wendy's, you know, weak and simpering here, say it's a terrible performance. I want you to watch her, just she is absolutely conveying the desperation. It's believable here that she wouldn't defend herself. She's trying to avoid the confrontation, and that's extremely believable. And Jack at this point is just absolutely firing off. Extremely exaggerated. People say he's crazy from the start in this, but no. He is amping this up. Nicholson very interestingly said that he quite liked the process. He liked to follow Kubrick's decisions and directions because he didn't like to be fully in control. He wanted to hand that over to the director because if the actor has too much control, everything becomes predictable and stale. And I really like that perspective. I found that really interesting. Kubrick here is moving us incredibly close to them. Not just a full-on face close-up, we need to see the arms, we see, need to see the threatening arms to feel weak, to feel vulnerable, to feel that Jack might just come out and smack us at any moment, but we are kept very close. Again, this is an area where the steady cam can really come to its fore. I wanted to talk about it when Danny was moving around on his bike in the corridors, but the thing about a commentary is it it is very difficult to get everything in. Ultimately, you do, I think, have to respond to what you see on screen. Otherwise, you might as well just do a video essay. You have to give people an experience to enhance watching the film as it plays out chronologically. It does make it very difficult to discuss aspects like uh, the impossible geometry or the uncanny. I have mentioned those over and over again when they show up. But ultimately, that's because they are dispersed throughout the movie. I want to show you just how frequent they are. Um, ultimately, the best way to discuss those aspects would be a supercut in a video. But um, in the course of a commentary, all I can do is highlight them as they come along. That line there, Wendy, darling, light of my life. I have often wondered if there is something else going on in the script there. I think it would be quite buried. So if it's there, it's subliminal. But something I detect a lot in this film is a, huge, a large number, maybe a suspicious number of references to nursery rhymes, sort of childhood phrases. So uh, Wendy Darling would be uh, Wendy Darling, the uh, character from uh, Peter Pan and Wendy. Uh, Light of My Life is more of a reference to Lolita, sort of maybe subliminal callback. You notice how Jack has moved now forward into light that has turned him red. As he's increasingly threatening, the light goes less natural and goes red. I really like that. Uh, there'll be a reference when he's trying to break into the uh, the bathroom uh, in the in the famous axe and here's Johnny scene. He will say, little pigs, little pigs, let me come in. Maybe when you rewatch next time... Um, Look out for those references to nursery rhymes. There's quite a few of them. 
Uh, Nicholson very wisely did not do that fall down the stairs himself. He insisted on a stunt double, uh, which was quite difficult to get. But he uh, he just knew from this point that Stanley would have made him do it dozens and dozens and dozens of times. So very wisely demurred. Now, anyway, I think I will finally talk about the steady cam. Uh, it's not the most opportune moment to do it, but uh, we we should get into it. So this is something quite revolutionary in and innovative in the shining, which we find it hard to appreciate. This was done in 1980, and this is one of the very early films that was made using a steady cam. Only a couple were done that way before it. Uh, so Rocky is one of them. I believe the other one is Bound for Glory. And they were making great use of this wonderful camera that used counterweights and gimbals um, to stabilise a camera so that a cameraman could carry it around with him and get a smooth shot, not juttery, not, not jittery, not juttery, and not needing to lay down tracks. Typically, you would lay down tracks, uh, get your camera on a dolly rig, and then move it along so you'd have that stability as you move, which all helps with your fro focus and clarity of picture. The steady cam lets you just move around. We can see it in action here. It's, it's much more when, when people are moving, you will get that. And because Kubrick built such a huge set, he wanted to take advantage of it, not use... Um, tracks as you would typically do, but be able to just move around freely. He was so excited by the possibility of the steady cam and how it would allow him to shoot differently. So he, uh, having seen a demo, uh, got in contact with the direct, with the creator of the steady cam, that was a man by the name of Gout Brown, and brought him round on set to supplement the main director of photography um, so that Gout Brown was doing all the steady cam work. And that has some of the most memorable results, chiefly when they are running in the maze and when Danny is going around on his little bike. That is steady cam that would have been a nightmare to do if you uh, were doing it on a um, on a track. Now, of course, Kubrick was happy, but he wasn't totally satisfied. He asked if the thing could be lowered because it was traditionally uh, originally in the first model. It was about 18 inches off the ground. And Kubrick wanted it much lower to the ground. Why did he want that? Because when it's lower to the ground, uh, you will get a sense of speed. It will feel like Danny's going a lot faster. You will feel the motion a lot more if the camera is closer to the ground than it's passing. Uh, so that is uh, kind of a key thing. By the time he comes on board, Garrett Brown uh, has innovated again and is working on a new model of the Steadicam, which can go lower. So he was able to accomplish that. Um, but they also had a really, really interesting adaptation to uh, to build it further, which is they mounted the steady cam on a wheelchair so that they could move it even smoother and uh, get lower to the ground. So Garrett Brown goes on this wheelchair. Stanley wants to see what he's doing, so he sits in the chair as well. And then he has a platform built on the back for a couple of guys to get on holding the sound equipment. By the time he's done modifying it so they can get the shot that they want, there are five people on this modified wheelchair carrying ridiculously expensive equipment. And the obvious thing happened. It collapsed. It broke. It capsized. Luckily, no injuries, but they then uh, made further modifications so that it was a bit safer. But I just I love that imagery of uh, Kubrick sat in the party wheelchair rolling along as he goes. It's a, it's a fantastic bit of image for me. Now, the Steadicam was being pushed to its limits on The Shining. Uh, it's pretty darn good for going along the wide open corridors, uh, but it has an extra limitation uh, in tight spaces. And that is what Kubrick wanted it to do. In the finale in the maze, which uh, we have to remind you is an invention of the film, the corners are very tight and following people running around the maze doing tight turns was a bit of a nightmare. And at least a kind of a fun story. Kubrick is hands-on. You may have got the impression of this uh, from the stories I've told, but he's going along and he's, um, when he wants Garrett Brown to keep the focus, he'll tug him. He'll tug the pole 
uh, to keep it exactly where he wants. But this will throw the shot off and also it will throw Garrett Brown off, who's carrying, let us remember, extremely heavy equipment. And this is driving him mad. He's a big guy, but he knows he can't really talk to Kubrick directly. But he's got a very good sense of the politics and how things work in a Kubrick set. So he consults with someone about it and he arranges a fake conversation uh, within earshot of Vivian Kubrick, uh, talking about how basically Sylvester Stallone kept grabbing the pole, kept grabbing the steady cam and jerking it around uh, when he was directing Rocky and Brown lost it, warned him. And when he kept doing it, he just smacked him on and knocked Stallone down. Now that story goes back to Kubrick and then the next day uh, via Vivian and then the next day they find out that uh, Stanley reaches for the pole, tries to jerk uh, Garrett Brown again and then reaches back, just remembering the story. And I love that. That um, fun little anecdote. Here we have one of those pivotal points that I discussed previously. The bit where this could be all supernatural or we could try and find a natural explanation for it. Wendy has knocked Jack out, as you know, and dragged him in here and locked it. So how does Jack get out of this? And Wendy and Danny are trapped too, are trapped by the snow in the sabotage snow cat. Ultimately, uh, if Halloran doesn't come and save them and give them a new snow cat, they would be screwed. So he is essential, even if he doesn't help in the way he hoped he would help. But they could have lasted if Jack stayed in. How does he get out? That's a question. By the way, we should know in favour of the psychological approach, the door he's looking at is somewhat reflective. It's not a mirror, but it is somewhat reflective. However, at this point, what Kubrick does want you to take away is that now after sitting with the psychological explanations for so long, the opening of this door is going to be confirmation that something supernatural is going on. It's a heck of a lot more subtle than creepy hedge animals going around, or a spooky uh, fire hose, if you remember the Stephen King version. It's a lot more subtle, but ultimately, this is a supernatural story. Even if uh, Rob Agar managed to find several ways that uh, could naturally explain Jack getting out here. Uh, one of which I thought the most creative was uh, Danny basically being in a trance, letting him out. Danny being manipulated by the hotel to do that. And I quite like that version. Something I don't think I added on is that um, in making his version of The Shining, which he called Stephen King's The Shining, to make sure it differs from Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, I'm pretty, pretty sure that... Um, Kubrick putting his name of the title irked King no end. Um, in order to make his version with the spooky, terrible CGI fire hose, it is there. Do look up the clip, folks. Um, King had to sign a non-disparagement agreement uh, with Kubrick, which is why his comments about it, mixed and nuanced as they are, do stop short in 1997. I think on re-evaluation, he probably would go back and be a little kinder to it. I think he's probably mellowed, but you can understand you'd be annoyed about someone getting credit for work where it was so different from your vision. But that is an experience a lot of the authors who worked with Kubrick had. He would adapt, he would adapt freely, but he never felt bound to do exactly what authors wanted because he is a man with his own vision. Anything he adapted is always a springboard. This shot here of Danny with a knife, it gives me a little pang of um, Halloween. Always makes you think of that. It's a tough, tough sell as well. Having to go around just with the one line, croaking red rum over and over. As I said, Red Rum there, um, coming from Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House, the room that uh, must not be opened until suddenly it is revealing something sinister. But of course, in two, room 237 in this does the same thing. 
it's a room that's locked until the hotel decides it should be opened. Great example of where Kubrick decided to just step over Stephen King and take ideas from Shirley Jackson to make a much more authentically gothic horror in a way. Gothic, I should say, in spirit, not in the kind of design that you might expect from um, a Roger Corman American International Pictures film with Vincent Price, as much as I do genuinely love them. But gothic in spirit, and we have to remember that Diane Johnson, the writing partner on this, um, she was an expert in that. Oh, I absolutely love this. Uh, the song we're going to get from this is going to be difficult to uh, difficult to pronounce, forgive me. But it's from the other um, composer who contributed so much to the soundtrack, well, the most to the soundtrack, uh, Christoph Penderecki. And this particular track is Utrenja Evangelia, and I hope I pronounced that okay. Absolutely iconic sound. Very unusual. Wendy Carlos, um, I think she was Wendy Carlos when she worked on this. Um, I think she was Walter Carlos when she was uh, making Clockwork Orange. There's a really good documentary on her. It's just short, it's about seven and a half minutes, where she demonstrates some of the things she tried to do that uh, Kubrick didn't go for. A really interesting use of an instrument called a circular controller or a circon. Absolutely astounding. Now this section always seems to get referenced in those lists that do the uh, top 100 scariest movie moments of all time. And it, it's always such an odd match to me. Like the whole film is not really about this crescendo here. It's This is a sort of eye-catching moment, but I think The Shining is a lot more about that consistent, unnerving fear that goes throughout rather than like any one particular payoff like this scene. Not that it's not incredibly effective, of course. I point out earlier how this is absolute impossible geometry. There's no way that window can open there. How's that for a fro throwback? Wendy, I'm home. Now, after all the talk way back in the start of this to um, the uncanny and the heimlich and the unheimlich. That is, of course, a coincidence there, but I believe that was one of the improvised lines. The most famous improvised line, of course, will come later. Now this is going to split up quite a lot because Danny and Wendy will now, will now sort of separate. In the early parts of the film you'll notice that their outfits are colour coded together a lot. They're both wearing blue and red together consistently. Especially that first scene back in the Torrance's apartment. Um, where was it? In Boulder? I struggle to remember. Now they've, uh, they've gone very disparate and they're going to go in a very different direction. And... Um, I will, I will give my interpretation of Wendy's movement, uh, sorry, Wendy's plotline from here on out because it is um, source of some controversy. Here we're going to get little pigs, I believe. Little pigs, little pigs. I suppose we're also getting in Danny a sort of Hansel and Gretel-like image of the tracing your uh, footsteps back so you aren't lost. They've really written themselves into a corner at this point. Which is of course why uh, which is of course why Halloran arriving helps out a lot. There is the little pigs, little pigs I mentioned, as I said, on your next rewatch, just look out for that stuff. Now this is tough writing here. You have got them themselves pretty much written into a corner. Uh, Wendy can't get out. Jack is obviously going to get in. Uh, we know the odds. We've seen how quickly he's gone through one door. We know he's getting through that door in no time at all. And I absolutely love how the camera movement is emphasising the swing of the axe. It makes it so dynamic. It makes it, what's the word, uh, kinesthetic. You've got to think this must have been exhausting to try and do to keep up this energy. If you watch the making of, you see Jack working himself up for the scene. And it's so much effort so that he can go in... Um, I guess, full pace. Uh, one of the common trivia bits that you'll hear about this is that, um, oh, we'll hit the camera now. Maybe that's the second uh, mistake that we see in The Shining. 
Very unusual for Kubrick. But I guess they had a limited number of doors that they could put in. As mentioned, that is a, that is an improvisation by Jack Nicholson. I almost wonder if he's taking so many takes. Is he just throwing stuff out and hit on that absolute gem? One of the most iconic scenes in all of horror there. Uh, just brilliant. And one of the bits of trivia that you'll hear many a time is that because Jack Nicholson was in shape and used to work as a volunteer firefighter, he could get through those doors in absolutely no time whatsoever. No challenge to him. So uh, they had to slow that down and take away these sort of fake balsa wood doors and go for a real door. Even then, look at how quickly he was smashing through that. Now, I've clearly reached an impasse there, and it's lucky that they didn't let themselves be written into the corner. Halloran now arrives to bail them out. Now, this will be something that, um, again, Stephen King, not a fan of. Um, it also fed into the uh, the readings of The Shining as a an allegory for racism and colonialism in America that uh, the only person to actually die in it, or be killed in it, I should say, is Halloran, the Black Cook, who's referred to by, uh, you know, a terrible term earlier on in the bathroom <coughs> by uh, Delbert Grady, um, the archetypical English butler. I'm not saying there's nothing for that reading, but I can't say it particularly excites or interests me, but there is a fair amount in there, to be honest. So you may want to look into that yourself. I'm more interested in the fact that Kubrick, inevitably to a uh, king's chagrin, switches round the ending so that Halloran doesn't actually help save Wendy and Danny. He turns up making this long, arduous journey, only to be killed within minutes of entering the Overlook. You wonder if he knew. I don't think he would have. Would, would he have had the fortitude to come in if he knew he was going to die there? I don't think so, but he listened to the call of the hotel and did his bit. He didn't abandon Danny. It makes him an even more likeable character than he already is. But Kubrick is setting you up for this amazing surprise where, in contravention to horror movie tropes, they aren't going to be rescued. Halloran turns up after, and you've had so much of his journey. Think how much I know I've not focused on that huge, much, a huge amount, but you've seen so much of Halloran journeying to the Overlook. You saw him making the calls, hiring a snowmobile, taking a flight, and you are subconsciously primed at this point to expect him to save the day. If he weren't going to do something significant, if he weren't going to help, you know, be the man who would challenge the other man and fight. Why would they spend so much time on him? And the answer, very frankly, is to throw you off to mess with you. He obviously does help, just not in the way he intends to, because he brings a snowcat that lets Wendy and Danny escape, as Jack has sabotaged the one at the hotel. But it will also throw you off. It's a sort of Slight variation, I would say, on the classic uh, Marion Crane story, the Janet Lee character in Psycho. Now, it's not that uh, uh, Scatman Crothers is the biggest name in the story at all. Obviously, he wasn't. He would be reasonably well known. But the thing that catches you out is that so much development has gone into him. And for him to just be offed um, without achieving what you want, it throws you off as an audience member. You're just not prepared for this at all. This is also the section that he had to repeat so many times, just falling over and over again. It's also one of the few moments of quite notable violence in the film. The cuts to Danny there really sort of emphasise the horror, as do the sudden close-ups on, um, on the wound. Again, it's that editing choice at camera work to make it land as hard as it can. And it's absolutely brutal. Now, they probably could have worked it without the, the axe flying into, you know, an artificial chest, but it does the job. I also like this plot point of Danny had settled in. He had hidden. He was probably okay. 
but the psychic link that was useful, that was helpful to bring Halloran to assist them is the same link that gives Danny a connection that results in him freaking out. Excellent stuff. Okay, now something that gets criticised a lot is Wendy's running. I want you to pay attention to this. This is more typical lighting, isn't it? This is very typical horror lighting, in huge contrast to what we've talked about before. Oh, hang on. This shot, where we zoom in, this sudden smash zoom, here it is. This is taken from the haunting as well. Now that's the haunting, the um, the adaptation, the Robert Wise adaptation of The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. But that used some amazing um, zooms, shaky zooms like that to deliver incredible scares. Um, and I think Kubrick using it there is also another tribute to The Haunting, just as he did a tribute to Le Diabolique. He is not ashamed to use the best, and nor should he be. You want the best film that you can make. Now, as I said, we saw in there, in great contrast to the rest of the film, where everything is incredibly lit up and well lit, like, just as you would expect an actual hotel to be. In contrast to that, Wendy was going around there in sort of shadows, with very typical horror lighting, sort of half a face in shadow, half in light, her casting a big shadow on the wall, everything much darker. Contrast that with this shot. Maybe we should wait for us to return to that. This is the kind of shot that's absolutely punishing on the steady cam, but oh so memorable. Again, bizarre to think this is all a set, this is all a soundstage achieved with huge amounts of fog that help with the um, low visibility that you want from big snow and ridiculous amounts of um, of fake snow. The way the lights make everyone's silhouettes, I absolutely love it. It makes you think almost in terms of archetypes, you know, the father having to, the son having to escape the father. It makes it primal, absolutely primal, which hits you so much more. But going back to uh, Wendy, when we'll see her next, she will be running around the Overlook and she'll be basically hitting scare after scare. Her her running here, it does look ditzy. Her tripping over looks ditzy. She looks feckless. She looks kind of useless. She's kind of not attached to anything. Even she's got, even though she's got the knife, she doesn't look threatening. And you might wonder what's going on. What is up with that running? It looks goofy. Now, I don't think it's an accident at all. Are we going to get another zoom? There you go. There's another tribute to The Haunting right there. As I said, The Haunting and The Haunting of Hill House, they are some of the unspoken inspirations. Um, I don't think you'll hear people talk about that very often. But what we're seeing here with Wendy running around in a kind of goofy manner, encountering except for Halloran, I would say, basically unrelated scares. What is going on there? Do they look goofy? Is that a mistake? When you consider that Kubrick was making her do hundreds of takes of some scenes, I think we can write off a mistake. That is extremely deliberate. So why would Kubrick want her running around in a kind of goofy fashion? My explanation for that is that Kubrick... Oh, by the way, this is uh, also American only. Yeah, the Europeans did not see the scene. And I'll be honest, I can see why. I think it's quite weak. Um, it feels very cliche. It's a bit poltergeisty. I think this might have been pre-poltergeist, actually. Um, but anyway, a bit cliche. Just the dusty old skeletons. Kind of unrelated to what else we've got going on here. I think Kubrick was making her run around like that, looking like a dumb bimbo, because he was effectively taking aim at a typical horror movie. He appreciated The Exorcist, but he's coming up in a time of kind of easy, cheap slashes. They're starting to come out. And I think he knows 
he'd probably be reacting more to the kind of AIP Roger Corman horror movie. Um, but he's trying to move, I think, away from that typical style where you just have someone running around kind of fecklessly. If you think of, a, it is a great movie, but if you think of Suspiria and the way girls just kind of run around in an isolated fashion, uh, just encountering spooky stuff, it's a lot like what Wendy is doing. And I think Kubrick is accentuating how goofy it looks to kind of show you, I can do it. I can give you classic horror tropes. But I want to do something a lot more interesting. And finally having Wendy encounter these geysers of blood absolutely flowing out of the elevator. Such unusual imagery, astounding imagery with that music making it epic. That shows you he's beyond typical horror. So when Stephen King says he doesn't understand horror, that The Shining is made by someone who doesn't get horror, you got to call baloney on it. I think he understand there's no way Kubrick wouldn't have researched it thoroughly. And he knows exactly what he's meant to do. He decided to do something better. I maybe shouldn't say better. I should say more challenging. And he's a, it's enabled him to move The Shining away from a very tropey, typical film about a haunted hotel and move it into a deep oblique, difficult to read, psychological trauma film, dealing deep in archetypes, really challenging you to think what's going on under symbols, and basically being one of the few horror films that I would say is actually epic. Now, think of that as an epic movie. He has directed them, Spartacus, even though he disowned it. There's something about an epic movie that demands scale. And I think he was trying to get at that. But that's, I, I almost feel a clash with the nature of the horror genre, which should be very intimate. So Kubrick has kind of balanced these elements, but he's got epic imagery in with a very intimate tale and has tried to bring them together. And in that way, I think he ends up making it successfully an epic horror movie. Maybe an unusual take. Maybe you'll disagree with me. You're very welcome to. You do wonder at this point, I've got to say, why Jack doesn't go back. But the point of this beneath the symbolism, and I am very generous to films if I appreciate the symbolism, if I think they've got a good hidden meaning. I tend to be quite light on uh, questions of, uh, say, um, plot contrivances, you might say. I'll put that up. That is my own bias. Um, should Jack just go back? Maybe he should, but you could say he's lost in sort of the mania at that point, and that's why he doesn't. He could trace the steps back, but he is sort of lost himself. But more importantly, he's not going back because the labyrinth, the maze, always tends to be used as symbolism for the brain. The way the turns and curves of a maze seen overhead resemble folds in the brain structure. So the man lost in the maze is a man who has lost himself. He's lost to madness. He doesn't understand himself. Danny has some knowledge of the thing that causes a confusion and the madness in the hotel. Or deep within himself, I should say. But he overcomes it. He can trace his steps back. He grounds himself in family, in fact, when he goes back to his mother. But Jack is cut off by that. That's why he never finds his way out of the maze. And not sound like Jordan Peterson here, but it's that kind of level of symbolism and meaning that we should think of to get the most out of The Shining. And that's how you're left with this brilliant image of Jack just going all out, unashamed, absolutely sincere, no irony, just bellowing. Absolutely lost in the maze, never to recover. We'll move now from away from details of him as we're losing him he's going to get more and more silhouetted showing that we're losing definition he's just losing himself even more now he can't even make out facial details he gets more obscure until Kubrick will once again hit us with an absolutely brutal smash cut as he's done throughout this 
it's to be expected really yeah, absolutely outstanding absolutely outstanding um it's just full commitment to it now of course uh this ending what we're zooming in on Stephen King hated it what's going on here you have been told throughout that uh Jack has always been here now you might get some readings from Kubrick talking about this as a kind of predestination a kind of Buddhist reincarnation thing where people are doomed to repeat things I prefer to see it as a bit of a human condition thing, which is not exclusive from Kubrick's understanding in some of the things he voiced. This is a symbol that we will always be here. Jack has always been here because he was always vulnerable to the experiences that he had. He was always vulnerable to the excesses that in isolation in the Overlook Hotel, ungrounded from society and stabilising influences, that was able to take him over. That's why he was always here. He was always able to be this. Um, he was actually sort of edited into this. Um, they were reusing a stock footage and just adding a few people in. And mu much has been made of the uh, symbolism of how he stands, how he has his arms, one arm raised, the other down, uh, reminiscent of the most classic image of Baphomet. Uh, that's a little schizo posting for me. I will not be going down that line, but I think it gives you an idea of just how deep you can go down the rabbit hole when you start looking at The Shining. I have only been able to cover, I feel, a fraction of what you can get from this film. I feel it certainly helped to read widely around the rest of Kubrick's life and career, and that really helped me understand it in a very different way. Um... But there are much deeper mysteries and I would encourage you to look them out. But that is effectively everything I have to say. We are being played out now by Midnight, The Stars and You. Funny interesting there that film editor was credited to Ray Lovejoy. Maybe keep your eye out on the uh, credits for, uh, for Gordon Stainforth. Uh, certainly as he did so much, he'd be credited. And Kubrick is there taking time to credit uh, the musical influences. Interesting that um, Carlos and Elkind are coming after Penderecki and Bella Bartok. I wonder how they felt about that. Hopefully, hopefully not too put out. Anyway, as we enjoy Midnight, the Stars and You, a rather classic, uh, classic song that uh, I actually had played at my wedding. Um... You know, you have to argue for a few uh, personal treats in there. Atypical, but I think I got away with it. Um, I will leave you here. There is so much more that we could say about uh, The Shining, but we are coming to the end. So thank you very much for watching and listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope I've added to your appreciation of The Shining. It is one of my favourite films of all time for many a reason. And I hope I've raised it in your estimation. Uh, please do check out the other commentaries that I've done as part of the series and do watch the actual episodes themselves. But that is everything from me and I will leave you now. Thank you ever so much. Thanks y'all. Cheese.